the midst of temptation. So for this, we're going to go into James. We're going to go to the first chapter. We'll start off on verses 12. And I'll be reading along with you on the screen. It says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those that love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone else. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires. Everybody say, own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. And lastly, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. So we continue this series, Next Level Living. What does that mean? Through the book of James, one of the things that we've been seeing is that it's been written in a format of brotherly love. James is addressing uh, points and things that a church and a believer will go through. And it's done in a way that he emphasizes the greatest commandment that God gave us, right? The first one is to love God with everything. And the second one is to love your neighbor. And he's saying, I'm going to take care of the 12 that are scattered. And this book is written where it's giving you constant uh, uh, feedback. It's giving you constant, uh, this is what's going to happen. It's letting you know the things that you will go through and how valuable it is because besides being believers, Believers, we are all human and we face things like doubt and we face things like stress and we face things like tiredness and we face things like imperfection. So the things that we go through, we may not always be perfect in it, right? And James is addressing, brothers, these are the things that you will face. And in these last series, we talked about next level joy. We talked about next level faith, wisdom, humbleness, and today, victory when it doesn't seem possible. When we think about the word temptation, we don't typically think about good things, right? When we say temptation out loud, we don't really think about, well, I wish I was tempted in this thing. We typically associate uh, things that we rather not talk about, things that we rather not bring up. And that's because typically the word temptation t tends to be wrapped around embarrassment and lies. When we think about temptation, it's probably not something that you're talking about after church. Probably not even something talking about with people from church. And most likely, it's probably something you're not talking about with your spouse, right? When we think about temptation, it's probably a conversation that, you know, the wise in the group would probably bring to God, but many of us find ourselves hiding it from God. Again, temptation, it's not something we want to associate ourselves because the typical uh, 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 prelude of temptation is sin. And as we have read, when it's sin, it, it brings forth birth to something. So it's a conversation that we tend to avoid. It's a conversation that many of us know about and, and, and many of us who fill the, the building today are aware about, but it's something we don't really talk about, again, because it brings embarrassment or because we have to wrap it around with lies. Temptation seems to be those secret things that many of us, it's a popular uh, church term that we call our favorite sin. Temptation seems to be those things that uh, we know what they are and that we tend to fight about but not are always victorious. And because we decided that they're okay, we turn it into our favorite sin. And a funny term to have in church, but it's true nonetheless. See, many of us, we're not victorious daily. We're not victorious weekly. Many of us are not victorious half of the day. When we're in church in this wonderful praise, many of us are victorious. And we feel like we can take the world on. But many of us at 12 o'clock, 1130, we're tired. When we're here, our spirit is filled and our flesh is also willing. But as soon as the church is over, our spirit indeed may be still willing. But we're tired now and we're hungry now. And there's things that distract us from the goodness of God. Verse 12 said, blessed is he that endureth temptation. He that endures temptation. It's a powerful subscripture that lets us know that enduring temptation is not something that we can take as being easy or something that would only happen once. See, grammatically, the way it is written, it says endures temptation. You will have more than one temptation. It's not specific to a temptation. There will be things that you have to endure. It doesn't talk about a time. It doesn't talk about a length. It talks about a process. Enduring temptation. He that loves God. 
Blessed is he that endures temptation. When we fail to endure temptation, as scripture shows us, uh, we may be doing it, uh, we, we fall ourselves uh, falling and failing. And because of that, again, to the conversation that is wrapped with embarrassment, we see it with Adam and Eve. Uh, it's very early in the scriptures. In Genesis 3, 8, uh, we read that it says, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. So th this, this temptation that Eve had and, and that she failed in and she invited Adam into, you know, they both are equally at fault there. Um, but she brought forth to Adam and they both failed in it. Caused them to what? To hide from the Lord God. Amen? That, that temptation that they had to endure... They failed it, and the immediate reaction that they had afterwards was a revelation of things, of course, and then hiding from the presence of God. And the wonderful thing, or the thing that you can look into just a little bit more in that scripture, is that if you really look at the reason that they ate the fruit, wasn't, wasn't really the purpose that maybe you and I eat today, right? You and I eat today maybe just to satisfy hunger. But the interesting part about them failing and eating from that fruit was because of the gain that they were going to have. They weren't really satisfying the official hunger that maybe a fruit would have, but because they wanted to know a little bit more. They wanted to know what it would be like to be like God. And sin will work in that way. We may think it's a certain, that it has a certain superficial look to it, but in, in reality, it can bring a lot more into it. So temptation is not something we boast about or even sometimes talk about, uh, but it's something we shouldn't fear to talk about either. Instead, we should look at everything that we face in life, as long as we're walking in with God, to find it a purpose. Can there be a purpose? Facing temptation, can there be a purpose? Like Adam and Eve, they didn't endure the faith, and that failure could have caused other things. Uh, we see back to the scriptures of verse 12 that there may be a purpose, right? It says, blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown that the Lord has promised to those that love him. It's very clear that there is a purpose, if you will, to temptation. Blessed is the man that endures it. So you have to endure temptation. And if we endure temptation, it says that we will be then approved to receive what the Lord has promised for those that love him. So is the scripture telling us that if we don't endure temptation, we don't love God? Yes. Right? Yes, because literally that's what the scripture says. And no, because we have a loving and merciful God. So for the no, this is where I want to uh, focus for the, the remainder of the time. Let's study how this could be a no. I mean, the scripture is very clear. For those that love him, for those that love God, those are the ones that are going to endure temptation, right? And those are the ones that are going to receive the crown. So how do we find a no in this very clear scripture? This no where it lets us know that it's okay if we're not perfect day in and day out. This no that lets us know that there is hope. This no that lets us know that we're going to make it. This no that lets us know that there's an altar where you can let it all. Let us study that. So for point number one. It says, knowing the difference between a trial and a temptation. Knowing the difference between a trial and a temptation. Now, we should now, by now, know the difference between a trial and temptation. When Brother Wendell uh, gave us a powerful word, we understood of next level joy in the midst of it. And we understood what it meant to live in the middle of a trial. Because why? Because God was with us. And we, and we had the opportunity of experiencing next level joy. And what happens a lot in time in church is that a lot of us are, are so used to having this, uh, uh, this constant temptation that we fail in and it becomes a habitual sin that we begin to think that as, as a trial. And, and we practice these things. For some of us, it's drinking. For some of us, it's cursing. For us, some of us, it may, may be whatever it may be. 
but we practice it so much that we turn it into our head into a trial well the lord is probably trying to tell me this every time i go there i pick up a bottle maybe the lord is trying to tell me that i i need to work something in that in that bar or something maybe the lord is just trying to remind you that you shouldn't be in that place and you shouldn't pick up the bottle Many of us are stuck in the same routine, watching the same things over and over. And maybe the Lord is going to make me a powerful uh, speaker against uh, a pornography. And that's what the Lord is going to do. Well, maybe you should just stop watching that stuff and focus into Christ. We sometimes forget to see the blinding differences in a trial and temptation. A trial, most of the time, is something that you bring out in public. A trial is something that you have a prayer chain about. A trial is something that you're not afraid to bring forth to the altar. It's not something you're afraid to tell somebody, to confide in somebody. You're letting people know about this trial that you have because you know that God is with you. And although you may not be able to see him, you know that he's there with you. So you're willing to express your pain. You're willing to express your stress. You're willing to express everything that you're going through where temptation, it's something that you're not talking about. Temptation is something that you're probably not bringing to the altar because it probably doesn't let you walk in through the doors. Temptation is something that you're probably holding back here and you're harboring it back here and the altar has never heard about it. The Father has never heard about it. A trial is made of a special fire that when you go through it, you come out purified. Temptation is made of a special fire that when you go through it, it consumes you in the midst of your situation. Have you ever seen how they clean gold? Through the fire. They put it through the fire, it lights up, it gets really bright, and all the imperfections are falling out of it. And at the end, it's clean, it's gold. That's what a fire, a trial under, with God looks like. Another interesting uh, characteristic is that a trial will sometimes hold temptations in it. You see, Job went through a powerful trial. In the middle of a trial, he had a temptation. And that temptation, he could have endured it or failed in it. And, and he chose to endure it, right? His wife came in and said, do, do, do you still trust him? Does your, do you still fast in your integrity? And, and he said, just curse God and die. And Job didn't do that. Job understood the purpose of his trial. He knew that in the trial, God was with him. And that's why we read later on in the chapters that, that, that Job says, I look for you in the east and I don't see you. I look for you in the west and I can't find you. I look for you in the north and you're hidden. I look for you in the south and you're concealed. But I know that you know where I am going. And then when I am approved and tested, then I will be clean and I will be purified as gold. A trial is a time where God shows you how much he loves you. And temptation should be the, the opportunity where you show God how much you love him. It's very clear that temptation is a place where you validate your faith as the scripture states for when he has been approved. The purpose to approve us is that through the testing we would be revealed as genuine and strong in our faith. It's just like a relationship. There's give and take in a relationship. There's love in a relationship. There's communion on both sides. There needs to be a relationship. Just think about you and your spouse. If one side was always giving, 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 and the other side always taking, 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 it probably wouldn't be healthy. It probably would be something that you wouldn't be uh, so happy to be part of. It's probably a, a relationship that requires a lot of, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. It'll be better next time. You know, I think the only time you're able to do that is on Valentine's, right? The girls always get the gifts and the guys don't. But that's probably the only time. Every, every other time is 50-50, give and take. I love you. And when you say that, you want to hear it back. You don't want to hear me too, right? It's a give and take. It's a constant sacrifice. It's a relationship that needs to be built up. 
And I know that many of us probably have tuned this whole thing out because the word temptation is associated to it. And because, you know, typically when we think about temptations, we think about sexual immoralities and we think about uh, illegal acts and we think about certain things that maybe we're strong against and we don't, we don't put ourselves in those situations. So we're like, temptation is not for me. I'll sit in here and I'll take it. But temptation uh, uh, is specific to the individual. One thing is true, which is your point number two. You are the filter for the temptation that you'll face. You are the filter for the temptation that you'll face. Scripture says in Mark 7.20, it says, and then he said, it is what comes from inside of you that defiles you. For from, without of, from within, for from within, out of a person's heart, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. And foolishness, we understood, right? There's five fools, and six, a sixth one slipped in there last week. All these vile things come from within. They are what defile you. So what does that mean? That means that many of us could be put in a room today filled with, with drugs, alcohol, worldly music, and it does nothing to us. Some of us, we would be dying in there, right? We would be wanting to try that stuff. Some of us could be put in a room uh, where there's a lot of money and no one's gonna watch you if you take it. And some of us would do just fine and walk away. But some of us are itching to grab at it. Some of us would be put in a room filled with all kinds of juicy information about so-and-so and them and that, and some of us would just pray for them. But some of us wouldn't, you know, we would be waiting to see who could we call about them and then cut that time off to call the next person about them, call that time. So you are the filter for your temptation. You are the most aware of where and when you will fail. You are the most aware when you will say yes and when you will say no. We are to work every day in this vertical relationship. Every day so that we are able to say no when it's appropriate and say yes when it's appropriate. Many of us say no when we're asked if we know Christ. Many of us say yes and we bring someone to Christ. So you are the filter. You are to be aware of when you're supposed to say no and when you're supposed to say yes. And some of us, because we are the filter, we need to, we need to admit when temptation is temptation. And, and this temptation that we have is no longer something because we're in a modern age or it's something because uh, we've learned to practice it. Uh, temptation is temptation. And if you're not willing to express it with everybody, well, maybe there's a reason for that. And, and, it, and it's almost like not fair, right? We would think, well, if temptation is so strong and blessed is the one that endures, right away letting us know that there's those that won't endure it, then why does God allow us to go through these, through these temptations? Why does God tempt us this way? And, and scripture shows us in 13 that let no one say when he is tempted that I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt himself, does he himself tempt anyone? But each one of us is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and is enticed. You know what that tells me? That temptation is not a respecter of people, of age, of dreams, of goals, of titles, of anything. Because it comes from within us. So if it's already within you, then it is not respecting of you if you're acting in those temptations. It's something that comes within ourselves. And the illustration that is used here is drawn away, depending on the commentary that you read, it's, it's illustrating the exercise of a fisherman, right? He gets his fishing pole ready, he gets his string ready, he's got his hook, and then he puts on a bait and throws it out there. And then where he's fishing, the fish is either gonna be attracted to it or not, right? A fisherman knows what kind of fish he wants to get. He has the hook for that and he has the special bait for that. So there's always going to be that fish that comes to it, gets hooked, and gets drawn away, taken. And then uh, 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 that, that bait may not be something that you're interested in, but the hook is the same, the string is the same, and the person holding it at the end is the same. One day the bait is for you, the next day the bait is for somebody else. Again, you're the filter for your, for your temptation. 
And, and, and when we realize that, then we'll be able to respect ourselves. And what I mean by that, and I hope it comes out correctly, is that many of us have grown up in church. Many of us had had aspirations in church. Many of us dream of ourselves being in a certain place. And many of us have these visions and these dreams for our children and for our marriage. And you see yourself in a certain place when you were so connected with God. You know, you had, this is what we're going to be. We're going to be a power couple. We're going to be here. We're going to be there. If the God tells us to sell our house, we're going to sell our house. And we're going to move to wherever he moves us. But then you have kids, and you want them to have a room, and you want them to have toys, and then you get distracted because life is so convenient, and everything that we have is so close to us, that all of a sudden you say, well, maybe God, God's plan is just for me to be a member. Maybe God's plan is just for me to have a strong marriage, and it may be. But did you have other dreams behind it? Did you have other goals and aspirations? And what is it that's holding you back? Is it that temptation that we've that we learn to get accustomed to it remember adam and eve didn't fall into the eating of the fruit because they were hungry but because they wanted to know a little bit more they wanted to have another gain it is not easy to overcome temptation it requires an active relationship with god you and i are not alone in it uh and and and, and we read a, a interesting story in matthew uh, chapter 26, verse 41, where it says, Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh, the flesh is weak. And before I go in there, um, you know, when, when I was growing up, when I was uh, trying to date my wife, uh, you know, I remember uh, Fast and the Furious was coming out. And I had a little Honda Civic, uh, an 89 Honda Civic hatchback. And I had everything. I had, I had the 212s in the back. I had uh, the extra stuff that you put on the bumper that you don't need. I had the big muffler. I was that guy. And, uh, you know, I had everything. And, and I liked it, you know. And uh, I remember one time I was driving in with my dad. And I said, Dad, look at that guy. He has a broken tail. Like, why won't he fix it? And my dad said, well, you know, you'll find out that sometimes the budget's not over there. And I was like, budget's always there for my car. I don't get that. So I would take care of my car and I would wash it every morning. I get up every Saturday, sorry, not every morning. Every Saturday I get my bucket ready, filled up with water and soap. I get my sponges, I get the wipes. I had a wipey for inside, for the outside and for the rims. And then I had, you know, it was a sin. <laughs> no, but I had everything for it, right? And I would take care of that car and I would clean it from the outside, vacuum it from the inside. When I was cleaning, I would bump a Kerr Franklin stop. Do you guys remember that? And we, we used to listen to that while we were cleaning up, and, and I would take care of the front seat. And I'm like, because that's, that's where my chula is going to sit at, right? So she can sit right there, make sure that it's, it's nice and clean. And because uh, she would take care of the car too, right? She, if anybody was trying to do something, hey, don't do that to his car. And, you know, we had everything nice. We would clean it from the outside, and we would take the time to clean it from the inside. We would clean the windshield from the outside, from the inside, the windows from the outside, and from the inside. And uh, it was my car. I was taking care of it. Everything was perfect. And, and uh, you know, luckily for me, my wife said yes. And fast forward so many years later, we have four kids. We have a car, and things become convenient. Now there's automatic car washes, right? Where you can make your car look clean from the outside. So we take advantage of those things. And, and, and when you clean them from the outside, you put, go in there, you pay for the expensive one, right? Because the expensive one's gonna clean the rims too. So it makes it look like you took some time. So we go through it, we get our car clean, and we forget about the inside sometimes, right? And now with our car, we'll let the kids eat inside. Where before, no one could eat in the car. I wouldn't even watch if their shoes were dirty. I just cleaned it, you know? And if your keys were in the back, put them in the front, bro. You're going to cut the seats. And, and now it's like, it's all right. I'll pick it up later. You know, you drop some fries. I'll vacuum it. Don't worry. And the other day we were driving and the sun hit the car in a certain way where it let me know that the windshield was not so clean. It was clean from the outside, but from the inside, there was all this dust that was, that was layering it in, and we couldn't see. My wife's like, well, I can't see from my side. And I said, well, you could kind of see. If I, okay, I'll clean it. And you keep driving, right? 
And, and, and it's, it's funny how our relationship in Christ is something I like, sometimes like that, right? When we have the time and we're really in love with it and we, we appreciate it, we go ahead and set the time to make sure that we're clean from the outside and the inside, that God knows us day in and day out, that, that we have a vertical relationship with him that is constant, that we can pick up where we left off. And I say this to the men because uh, I'm the one that cleans the car. I'm not sure if you're the one that cleans the car at your house, but uh, think about the car, about the lives that you live, right? You put the people that you care about in that car. And if we're just always doing the superficial things, then what are we really teaching them inside, right? If we can't really see because our vision is impaired, then guess what? My wife's vision is impaired. Guess what? My children's vision is impaired. And because we don't have this constant relationship, then temptation is not gonna be so easy to endure. So Matthew, Jesus is telling his disciples, hey, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. This is after he went up to pray. He went up to pray, and if you read that prayer, Jesus is praying, let this thing pass. He knew he was going to get crucified. Let this thing pass, but don't let my will be done. Let your will be done. And he said, I'm going to go pray, and I need you guys to pray. I need you guys to watch and pray while I am praying for this. And you got to ask yourselves because he comes back down and he says, not even an hour. You couldn't even watch him pray for an hour because he found him asleep. Would history be different? Would, would if, if they would have united in prayer with Jesus, would anything of his story be different? Does it matter? I think what we take from that story is that if our relationship, our vertical relationship with Jesus is not active and constant, then we are not watchful and we are not prayerful. That we're not able to go ahead and guide our families where they need to be. And we're not able to listen to what the Lord is telling us to do. The illustration is that unless our vertical relationship is stable, then we risk falling into temptation. Remember, there is a time and place for rest. And rest is good, but there will be a time where there's no time left. There will be a time where there's no time left. The only way you endure temptation is by making sure that God knows you. That making sure that when in the midst of your temptation, you remember God. You know, in, in a trial, you're always looking for God, right? Brother, I don't know. I'm going to make it. I know he's with me. I'm just waiting to see what he has for me. You know he's with you. In temptation because we have it hidden we have it harbored away because we're allowing ourselves to experience with certain people we're allowing ourselves to experience it on certain days we keep it hidden this is mine I'll take care of it I got this one I can still I can still go to church on Sunday I can still feel his presence I can still raise my hand we've all met functional alcoholics right At, after a while you will become good in practicing it but there's a danger to that Point number three, temptation is easier to endure than it is to recover from. It's easier to say no than to go through a process and a 12-step program and to go through this, this changing of schedules and letting people know of what's going on. It's easier to say no than it is to recover from it. Verse 15, it says, then when the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin when it is full grown brings forth death. I think we all have that story that we could all uh, relate to that we had growing up, our parents telling us, don't do this and don't do that. And uh, it was a constant, right? I can't wait till I'm older so I can do whatever I want, right? You're just growing up, ah, you don't know. One of the things that my daughter does, she's not here. Uh, oh, she's like, yes. <laughs> when they answer you within their teeth, oh, <laughs> that makes me want to pray. Um, but it's, it's those little things, right? And I remember growing up and going, oh, they don't get it. And I talked to my brothers. Oh, don't, don't, they, they just don't know. They're from, they're from El Rancho. Uh, they, they don't get it yet. And, and, and sometimes we find ourselves in that situation, right? Where we think we know more than when Scripture tells us. Or we think no, we know more than the, the prayers of our parents, the prayers of our mother, the prayers of our father. Or we think we know more than our grandparents, uh, we find ourselves in that situation. It's like that little kid that's running around the house and the mom's telling him, don't run, mijo, you're gonna fall. The house is not for running. 
And the kid does another lap. Mijo, don't run. You're going to fall. The house is not for running. Does the kid stop? No. He does another lap. Mijo, you're going to fall. The house is not for running. doesn't stop. And all of a sudden, you hear a tas. And, and now, as a parent, <laughs> you, can re- you can assume that the parent's a little happy, right? <laughs> you're like, <sighs> I mean, let's be truthful. You were telling him to stop running around. You're going to get her. You're in the house. And then, pass, when he falls down, you're like, yep, I told you. I told you. So you see the kid crying, right? And, and, and kids are funny how they react. They react in one of two ways. You're going to have the kid that falls down, and then he's going to cry, all right? Mom, Dad, oh, it hurts. I got an owie or whatever. And my brother used to do that. And uh, he used to fall down, and, and he'd be like where the chairs are at. And my mom's like, well, come here so I can take care of you. He goes, no, it hurts. He goes, well, come here. So he would get up. He would walk over, lay down in front of my mom, get in the same position, start crying again. It hurts right here. Uh, But they came back. They knew where to go. They were looking for refuge. They were looking for help. They were looking for someone to acariciarlo, to someone to to, to love them. Amen. And then there's the other kid that falls down and smacks himself, gets back up and says, that ain't hurt. And he just walks away. That ain't hurt. He goes away, right? Goes to a room or he goes and hides on a corner. He, that kid just doesn't acknowledge what he just went through. And as Christians, we sometimes react that way. We fall down, we hurt ourselves, and we run away. And we blame the church and we blame God because we were told not to do those things. We were told to endure it. And when we fall in it, we hurt ourselves. And instead of crying to the God, crying to the altar, we say, that didn't hurt. I'm not the only one. That's old school. And we walk away. And that's because we don't really understand that what Romans tells us is that for the wages of sin is death, but the gift, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Sin in our lives will bring death to your ministry. If Joseph didn't resist his temptation, then his trial would have been pointless and his future would have been dead. Sin in our lives will bring death to relationships. Just like David had Uriah killed to hide his sin, we will have to eliminate people within our lives to allow us to function. Sin in our lives will bring death to speaking into life and speaking life into people. Unless you overcome and recover conversations around purity and faithfulness will be hard to speak of and hard for people to listen from you. Just like any relationship, when you fall, you must build a trust back up again if you are able to and if you are so lucky to. Your testimony will shape your marriage, your ministry, and your children. And lastly, the truth shall set you free, which is point number four. First John says, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. Psalms 51 says, have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins, wash me clean from my guilt, purify me from my sin, for I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Acts 3, it says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. As believers, we made a covenant to God, and it is to live for him and to love him, just to simply follow his greatest commandment, which is to love him and to love people. It says that you should love your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and the first commandment. And the second is like it, that you love your neighbor. Maybe our purpose in Christ is to be more than just faithful and to be committed. Maybe it's more than just making sure that you tithe and that you come. Maybe it's more than just making sure that your marriage is strong and that your children are saved. Maybe the purpose of a Christian believer is to enlarge his kingdom. Maybe the purpose is to make sure that we endure temptation and that we bring our neighbors here too. Maybe our purpose is to be more than self-sufficient. And I'll, I'll close with this. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. 
Satan's great strategy and temptation is to convince us of the pursuit of our corrupt desires. Will somehow produce life and goodness for us. If we remember that if we remember that Satan only comes to steal and to kill and to destroy, then we can more effectively resist the deceptions of temptation. And if we remember that through him we will have life and we will have it more abundantly. I'm gonna ask you to stand to your feet, please. We're not gonna go through the rest of the scriptures, but I will close with this example if, if you allow me to. And, and I hope that you understand that there is hope in Christ. I hope that you understand that if you fail, you have not been forgotten. And that if we fall into our temptation, there is hope today. If you think about any war, there's a military on both sides. And every military that goes to war, goes to war with the medic. Because they understand you will get hurt. They understand not every time it will be perfect. They understand that you're fighting with bullets. You're fighting with things that are there to kill you. Every military goes to war with the medic. Because you know why? It's okay if you're injured. You're not dead. I told you that story that I fell down the stairs, right? Uh, at the house. I was walking with my twins, taking them to school. And my, my, my daughter got ahead of me. My son stayed behind me. We're walking down the stairs. You know, we pass through that every single day. As a matter of fact, the carpet is, is lower on that area because we always walk through that, right? And I knew where the steps were. And because we were in a rush and I wasn't really prepared for that day, I got up late. I walked down the steps and I missed it. And I slipped. And I fell five or six down there and I got caught, you know, like a pretzel, but I was caught in the, in the stairs. And my daughter had made it all the way down. And when I recovered myself, you know, a little beat up, a little embarrassed and still in a little bit of pain, I look up and my son, he's whimpering because I heard him. I hit him. When I came down, I heard his little shoulder and his elbow and he was just there grabbing himself. And I said, are you okay? And he just didn't answer me. And then my daughter was down and she was just going, daddy, you're okay. Get up. Get up, daddy. You're okay. And I was like, yeah, I'm okay. But it hurts. Get up. You're okay. So I got up. I got up. And one of the things I noticed is that when I got up, I didn't have a pain no more that I was dealing with in a hip. That awkward fall stretched me in a way where that hip pain went away. Uh, so it took it out, right? But we all fall into that situation sometimes where we're so confident in the way that we walk. We're so confident in the things that we do daily. We're so confident because we've gotten good at it. We know where to step. We know how to lift up our hands. We know how to praise Jesus. We know how to do all these things that we sometimes forget to make sure that the foundation is set because we sometimes stick our ideology into theology and we disrupt this relationship that we have with God, right? And we all need to be surrounded by those two types of people in our lives. We have to have those people, the Lord calls us that, that we have to be the ones that the scriptures say that if, if you know that your brother or sister have sinned, then you humbly and gently go and pray for them and bring them back to Christ. And just like my daughter, it's okay, get up, get up. Everyone falls, get up. But we must not ignore the fact that in our falls, we will hurt others. And those that we hurt can be our future. Those that we hurt will remember that you hurt them. Those that we hurt will also have to learn how to endure. So I invite all of you. I invite you, all of those that are victorious, I invite you, all of those that are victorious, weekly, daily, monthly, I invite you all to come to this altar and hide it no more. Give it to Christ. Obviously, we can't hold it. It's obvious that it's not for us. 
So let's show God how much we love him and give it to him that we may have hope of receiving our crown of life. Amen. Would you come?